all this morning and uh why don't we all bow our hearts before the Lord and, and turn our attention to Him and give Him this time. So Father, we do thank You for this day that You've made, that You've allowed us to get up out of bed and to gather in Your name or to be with Your people. Lord, we thank You, God, that we are a people who are called out of darkness and have been called into Your wonderful light, Your wonderful truth. Lord, we don't take that for granted. We don't take that lightly. We rejoice in it this morning. We thank You for the hope of salvation. Lord, that uh, though death is real, Lord God, eternal life is realer, is more real. And we have that hope in Jesus Christ this morning. So we rejoice in this. May you be glorified today, Lord God, as we interact with each other. Uh, May you be glorified through our actions, with our thoughts. And may you be glorified with our worship this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. day we've gathered in your name calling out to you your glory like a fire awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth because you're the reason we're here you're the reason we're singing in this place your glory on our face we're looking to the skies descending like a cloud you're standing with us now Lord unveil our eyes cause you're the reason we're here you're the reason we're singing to see you open up the floodgates the mighty river flowing from your heart filling every part of our praise open up Lord open up the heavens we want to see
can be seated as we continue to worship uh, this morning through tithes and offerings.
Let the nation sing it louder Cause nothing has the power to say But your name The name of Jesus sets us free. Lord, it sets us free from the bondage of sin and temptation. It sets us free from the bondage of selfishness. Lord, it sets us free from the sick bed of complacency. Lord, we look to you, Jesus, to set our hearts ablaze for you, Lord, to fill our hearts afresh with the Spirit. Jesus, you can do that. We worship you, Lord. We thank you for the power in the name of Jesus. Yeah, I am set free, oh, 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 I am set free, oh, 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 it is for freedom that I am set free. Would you guys stand with me and sing that together? Sing it out. Sing, I am set free, oh. I am set free, oh, oh, it is for freedom that I am set free. Oh, broke my chains of sin and shame and covered me with grace. You in my life with your holy fire and cover me with grace. You are the hand that reaches out to say, I am set free. Oh, oh, oh. I am set free.
Jesus, Lord, that you bring freedom, Lord, that we are your disciples when we abide in your word, and that's when we know the truth, and the truth sets us free, Lord God. We thank you for revealing your word, revealing your truth through the pages of scripture, Lord God. We apply them to our lives because we believe it sets us free, Lord God. We thank you that we live in the new covenant, Lord, where we're not bound under the law, and bound under sin, Lord. But Jesus, you came that we would have life and freedom. You have set us free from the law of sin and death. You've set us free, Lord God, to live for you. We are free to love. There are no limits, Lord, to the love that you give us, and there are no limits to the love that you call us to walk in. We are completely free, Lord God. So we thank you for that this morning. We rejoice in it this morning, and we celebrate that work on the cross that brought us freedom, Lord Jesus. Lord, that you took on imprisonment. You took on the bondage of of sin. You took on the bondage of death itself on our behalf that we would be freed from it, Lord. And so we rejoice in these things this morning, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let's sing, we are grateful. Oh, and yes, Lord, we are grateful for your grace and for your love. We're thankful for you, Jesus. Yes, Lord, we are grateful for your grace and for your... Let's sing it out if you're thankful this morning. We sing, yes, Lord, we are grateful for your grace and for your... Love. You're worthy of our song, Jesus. Yes, Lord, we are grateful for for your grace and for your love. Amen. Let's give him a noise of thanksgiving. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Oh, you come at the right time when I least expect it never behind so why would I be surprised when you deliver every time on mountain tops on mountain tops you stay the same on valleys low you never change and I believe that I will see the goodness of the Lord I'm confident that seasons change for your faithfulness remains that's right me to prepare a blessing you make a way it's more than I could imagine more than I can fathom or comprehend on mountain tops you stay the same on valleys low never change and I believe that I will see the goodness of the Lord I'm confident as seasons change for 
your faithfulness remains. Yeah, faithful and true, Jesus. God of my present, God of my future, you write my story, you hold it all together. God of my present, God of my future, you write my story, you hold it all together. God of my present, God of my future, you write my story, you hold it all together. God of my present, God of my future. You write my story, you hold it all together. faithfulness remains oh, oh, oh. God of my present God of my present God of my future you write my story you hold it all together God of my God of my future, you write my story, you hold it all together. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And he will finish the work that he's begun in us. Awesome. Let's go ahead and take our seats as we cover a few announcements this morning. Well, uh, good morning, church. Um, glad you're all here with us uh, this Sunday morning. If anyone is new here for the first time, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand so we can greet you and say hello. Well, welcome. Uh, we're glad to have you guys here this morning. Um, if you would, pull out your bulletins. We have a few things we want to go over uh, this morning uh, before we get into our study today of the Word. Uh, the first thing, uh, we have a baby shower today after church at 2 p.m. for uh, Lily Irvin. Uh, John and Stacy have their little baby girl coming up on the way, and we're really excited for them. And so that's going to be today. Also, we have a ladies' hike coming up June 11th. Um, if the weather's good, then they'll be doing it. If it's like it is the past couple of days, then we might hold off until we get some better weather. Also, uh, we have the youth group uh, mission trip that's going on. Um, there's a lot of different fundraisers that we were doing. We're doing t-shirts that we can buy. Also, rent a youth where you can pay for uh, work to get done around your house if you want to hire some uh, youth group kids. I don't know how good the quality of work is. And what I've, uh, I've heard that if the youth group goes somewhere, usually Gabe goes with them, and Gabe does most of the work as the youth kid walks. So it's really rent a Gabe most of the time. And, but um, all of the money that goes from or gets from that goes to the uh, mission strip, so it's a really cool thing. Uh, we also have the men's camp out coming up. It's June 3rd and 4th. Uh, it's just for the guys. Uh, the, toss is, the cost is $10. Um, you guys can still sign up. It's not too late. It was a really awesome time last year, and it's going to be another awesome time this year. The campsite is beautiful. It's right by the river down in Arkansas. It's going to be sweet. Um, the Moms Park Fellowship, we just started this up a couple weeks ago, but it's just for... Uh, moms wanting to get together and just have a time to fellowship in that same stage of life. And what Sean said last week is even if you're not a mom, but you really want to pour into these ladies, you're welcome to go there too. Um, guys aren't really invited, uh, but girls can go and hang out and be in that time of fellowship. And then we also have the Titus Girls Bible Study coming up this Friday night, and it's at my house, or in the bulletin it says Natalie's house. That's my wife. It's at our house. And so... Uh, put that for if you have a girl that age uh, be going to that and I think that is everything for upcoming events at our church the right hand side is a place for prayer requests um, we've seen God do amazing things so we encourage you guys to use that um, fill it out put it in the agape box in the back and then we have a prayer team that goes over all of that and it's just cool to see God 
move in our congregation, especially when we get the opportunity to pray for each other. Um, it's just a very sweet thing. Sweet thing. So with that, I said it kind of fast. I'm sorry if you could keep up with me. If not, you have a bulletin, and it has all the information there for you, so you should be able to uh, see that. You guys can all stand up and say hello to one another this morning. sing this in faith, I will believe, and I will believe, for greater things, there's no power like the power of Jesus, so let faith rise, let all agree, there's no power like the power of, come on, sing that again, and I will believe, for greater things, there's no power like You guys quieted down before I could get up here and get set. And good morning, church. Good morning, online church. First thing I want to do is play the harp this morning. So just a little. I am blessed. My son Joey and Sean, that they are very creative, very very creative. And so, they, hey Tom, what if we do this? You can do anything once. If I like it, it stays. If I don't, it's gone. 
But uh, I like this. It's very kind of cool looking. So uh, anyway, we're going to continue our study through the book of 2 Peter. We are still in chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 5 through 11. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand, and Pastor Bruce will get one right to your seat so you can follow along with us. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. I should have had some sound effects to go with it. Just a little heart playing. Second service, let's find some uh, harp music. <laughs> no? <laughs> All right, starting in verse 5, Peter's writing, we read, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The title of my message this morning is Spiritual Supplements for Spiritual Growth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together, to be in your word, to know, Holy Spirit, that you are here to uh, illuminate to us, Lord, the things that we need to hear personally in our lives that would do that work in our lives, Lord, that you know that we need. Oftentimes we are short-sighted. We don't know what we need, Lord, but, but you do. And so you bring these verses as we study them into our lives to, to draw us closer to you, to, to illuminate, to show us things that we need to apply in our lives. And so, Lord, Lord, we don't want to be open to that. We want to take all that you have for us this morning. And Lord, we do pray if there's anyone that has joined us here in this room or here online watching us that, that does not have a personal relationship with your son, Jesus Christ, or not born again, they, they, they don't have their sin forgiven yet because they haven't come to you in repentance Lord, would you especially touch their heart today. Help them see their need for you and to turn to you today. Thank you for our time together, Lord. We commit it to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We live in a culture that is obsessed with being in good shape. We exercise regularly. We try to eat the right foods. We diet so we can lose weight. Diet and exercise. That's what the doctors say, you know, that, that'll keep you healthy and strong. And it's important to stay in shape. And oftentimes, people will take supplements. You know, they're working out, well, they're going to take this supplement or that supplement in order to, to help them really, you know, stay strong and healthy. Well, I happen to find a list of the weirdest supplements that people have taken, thinking it would be good for their bodies. First one, scaly anteater scales. This is real stuff. Pangolin mammal, used for everything from aiding rheumatism to promoting lactation, bought whole, then crushed for oral administration. How about this one? Fox lungs. True stuff. Animal organ, England, used to treat asthma and bronchitis, made it to serp alongside various roots, seeds, and plants. How about the next one? Bear bile. Animal extract, traditional Chinese medicine used for gallstones and gallbladder issues. My question is, who extracts it? <laughs> and it's really my question for the next one. Flying squirrel feces. Animal byproduct, traditional Chinese medicine to invigorate vessels and help with stomach and abominable, abominable issues. <laughs> abominable, too. <laughs> Consumed raw, cooked or steeped, depending on symptoms. I am pretty sure I'll take a big pass on all those supplements. But just the same, there are supplements that people take that are actually good for you. And they do help to, to enable you to live strong, healthy lives, have strong, healthy bodies. We think of nothing of taking those supplements to strengthen our lives physically. But what about those supplements to strengthen our lives spiritually? If I want to grow as a Christian, I need to be serious about having the right things in my spiritual diet. What supplements are you taking to help you grow spiritually? 
Well, this morning, if you're taking notes, Peter's going to point out seven of them that we need to take. That's the title of my, my message, really, is Seven Spiritual Supplements for Spiritual Growth. Now, when we come to faith in Christ, the Lord gives us the strength at that point to live godly lives, lives that are well-pleasing to Him. We get that when we're born again. Because according to verse 3 we looked at last week, he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue. And we looked at last time that the Lord has given to us purpose and power and precious promises. We have the, the purpose to, to share the gospel and to, and to live for Christ as long as we are on this earth. We have the power by the Holy Spirit working and moving in our lives to accomplish just that. And then we have God's word. His precious promises found in his word to live by. But then Peter adds in verse 5, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith. The phrase giving all diligence has the idea of making a, 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 an effort, taking your walk seriously and making it a priority. Why? Well, because of all that God has done for me, now I want to do for Him. I want to put forth my very best effort in all that I do to live for Him. That is why Peter says, add to your faith. Now you say, well, how can I add to my faith if I've already been given everything I need for life and godliness? Well, actually the word add there means to supplement or to lavishly supply to your faith. It means don't hold anything back. It was actually used when a Greek play was being put together. They're, they're, uh, they would have this uh, financial backer, someone who funded the whole production. And that budget would be set for the musicians and the actors and the singers, and they were paid based upon that budget. But here's where the word ad comes in. A generous backer would come along and say, here, take this and lavishly supply all that is necessary for the production. Understand, our Lord is our generous backer. He is a supplier of these supplements, and he has an unlimited supply. And now he says, take these resources that you've been given and use them to lavishly go with your faith. It's like this if uh, some of you single ladies are getting married and your dad is going to pay for the reception and pay for the honeymoon, but your dad also happens to be billionaire Elon Musk, and he says to you, sweetie, because I love you so much, do whatever you want for your reception and for your honeymoon. No, uh, no expense. We're not going to hold anything back. Listen, with a dad like that, you're not going to go to the dollar store to find decorations for your wedding. Yeah, you, your reception isn't going to be at the VFW hall, uh, as nice as those are. But, but Why? Because dad says he's going to lavishly supply what you need from his bank account. Same way, you're not going to go down to Motel 6 down in Branson for your honeymoon, even if they do leave the light on for you. No, you'll be going to some all-exclusive resort for your honeymoon, maybe a hotel on the moon flown there by an electric you know, rocket ship if your dad's Elon Musk. But you see, dad has made all of that available to you, and he wants you to use it. All you have to do is use it. Apply what God has already, apply, or already supplied for you. It's another way of looking at it. You go to the doctor. The doctor says, I, I've done an examination on you, and uh, here's the diagnosis. You require surgery. We're going to have to do this surgery. And, and then afterwards, I'm going to give you some of these medications post-op to help with the healing. See, the doctor, he's done it all. He has diagnosed you. He has performed the surgery, and he gives you the medication. You don't help with any of the process so far. You don't go to the doctor and say, okay, well, yeah, I like to work side by side, and if you can give me a scalpel while you're doing that, we can work together. No, you're not going to do that. That's foolish. But though he provides everything that you need, you still have post-op. You have to do by taking the medications and following his instructions. I mean, you've got to take the medications he prescribed for you. He's given them to you. Here, take this, 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 and this. That's what Peter's talking about here. We've been saved by faith alone, but faith needs to be nourished, needs to, 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 for it to grow strong. Like, like a bodybuilder, you know, to grow muscle, workouts are mandatory. But you get more from a workout by adding supplements. And this is true in your relationship with God. It's all faith. But faith grows by adding seven spiritual supplements that God has lavishly supplied for us. And the very first thing on the list, lavishly supplied for our faith, is that of virtue. Look again at verse 5. Giving all diligence, 
Add to your faith virtue. Virtue is a, it's a rare word. I, I found it used in all sorts of ways. It means moral excellence, courageous. It's a, no, a noble term meaning heroism or moral heroism. It's a quality of someone's life that, that makes them stand out as excellent. In classical times, the word meant the God-given ability to perform heroic deeds. In other words, you're a, a superhero of morality. You are a moral excellent man. You are a moral excellent woman, able to resist immorality with one single bounce. I mean, what do superheroes have in common? Some super strength that no one else has. Peter's saying God has given to you a superpower. It's moral excellence. So use it. This means that the darkness of our culture that is all around us, in the movies or on the TV or on the internet or in song lyrics or even the questionable jokes that people say at work, they should have no place in our lives. Our world, if it's not there already, is quickly becoming as immoral as Sodom and Gomorrah. But God has given us everything we need, we need to live in moral excellence. It's also worth noting that virtue is active. It means we're always ready to stand up for what is right and to say, no, that is wrong. Superman stood, what, for truth, justice, and the American way. We could say we stand for truth, justice, and the moral excellent way. So number one, first supplement is virtue. Next one we see add to that is knowledge. Again, verse five, but also for this very reason, give all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge. So the Lord is saying, I've given you faith, I've given you virtue, now I'm giving you the ability to attain knowledge. That word knowledge refers to insight and understanding. Now, why are we to add virtue before adding knowledge? Because if my mind is cluttered with, with pornography and the violence you see in movies and, and song lyrics that talk of vile things, then I won't be able to receive knowledge about life from the Word of God because I've filled my life with the junk food of this world. And what happens when you fill up on junk food? You get sluggish. You don't want to do anything. Instead of vitamin supplements, you're feasting on, on Twinkies and Ho-Hos and peanut butter cookies and Andes. Uh, I'm not saying the things of this world aren't appealing. And they're not all that bad. I mean, Andes is pretty good. But, but some, when, when taken in excess, do lead to heart attacks and, spiritually speaking, heartaches. Because you're no longer living a spirit-filled life, a powerful life, growing in the knowledge of our Lord, but instead you've allowed yourself to get out of shape spiritually. Where you're no longer experiencing the things of the Lord. And it's just one old story after another old story about what God did years ago in your life, but never anything new about what God is doing right now in your life. Why? Because you're not where you, sh you should be. See, moral excellence or virtue is that which makes room for us to take in the Word of God and gain the knowledge of our Lord so we can experience the Lord powerfully in our lives every single day, every moment of every single day. The knowledge spoken of here is a practical wisdom from God's Word to deal with the day-to-day -day issues of life. In context, it means you're cooperating with God by following His wisdom rather than the wisdom of this world. But the only way you can do that is by doing away with the things of this world. So we have virtue number one, knowledge number two. Next two supplements Peter says we need to take in are in verse six, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance. Two very important inward characteristics that we need to supplement in our lives, to apply to our lives. First, number three is self-control. I like the way one person defines self-control. The capacity to break a chocolate bar into four pieces with your bare hands and then just eat one of those pieces. That's self-control. I like this story. I've shared it before, but it fits, and it's funny. It's about a man observing a woman in the grocery store with a three-year-old girl in her basket. As they pass the cookie section, the child asks for cookies, and her mother sa says no. Well, the little girl immediately begins to whine and fuss, and the mother says quietly, now, Ellen, we just have half of the aisles left to go through. Don't be upset. It won't be long. Well, the man passed the mother again in the candy aisle. And of course, the little girl began to shout for candy. When she was told she couldn't have any candy, she began to cry again. The mother said, there, there, Ellen, only two more aisles to go, and then we'll be checking out. 
Well, the man happened to be behind the pair at the checkout when the little girl immediately began to cry for gum and burst into a terrible tantrum upon discovering there would be no gum purchased today. Well, the mother patiently said, Ellen, we'll be through with the checkout stand in five minutes, and then you can go home and have a nice nap. Well, the man followed them out of the parking lot and stopped the woman to compliment her. I couldn't help noticing how patient you were with little Ellen. The mother broke in. My little girl's name is Tammy. I'm Ellen. <laughs> there, there, Ellen. Just two more aisles. <laughs> Listen, when it comes to self-control, we're told in Proverbs 25, 28, whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Proverbs 16, 13 puts it in a more positive way. Righteous lips are the delight of kings, and they love him who speaks what is right. Self-control. What does that mean? It's a Greek word that means to hold oneself together. It spoke of an athlete who would say no to eating certain kinds of food and yes to certain kinds of training because he wanted to win the race. It means to hold together the desires and the passions, keep our flesh under control. Now, why is self-control to be added to knowledge? Because as I gain knowledge, if I'm not very careful, I will begin to say, well, now that I have knowledge about this, I can handle it. In fact, I can handle anything. Be careful. John Corson tells the story about a dear pastor friend of his who, who was mightily used by the Lord, but began to say, well, my studies have convinced me that Jesus drank alcohol. And then he went on to develop a, a, an extensive argument for why Christians should be able to drink. That led him and his wife to wine tasting events, which led to nightclubs, which led to dancing with other people, which led to divorce. John Corson writes, In the name of knowledge, his dear brother sacrificed temperance and lost his family and ministry as a result. See, Peter here warns us that as we, as we add knowledge, we must be sure we don't get caught up with that knowledge that we become a, a know-it-all. And we think, though, well, I have the liberty to indulge in certain things that, that I know I can handle that, that, that will ultimately destroy us. Listen, it doesn't matter how long you've walked with the Lord. Even though we are born again and have that new nature, as long as we are in these bodies, we're going to struggle and wrestle with our flesh, with our old nature. On top of that, because we have an adversary, the devil who is out to get us, he's going to constantly use things in this world to appeal to that old nature. He'll appeal to our flesh every single chance that he gets. Satan will like nothing less than to see you and I get out of control as a Christian. But again, remember, we're told God already has given us everything we need for life and godliness. He's given us the power through the Holy Spirit to not lose control. It's already been given to us. He's given us that, that new nature, one under the control and leading of the Holy Spirit that is in direct opposition to our old sinful nature. So how do we gain control over our flesh? How do we gain control over our nature? Well, Paul tells us, tells us in Colossians 3, 5, to put to death your members which are on the earth. In other words, we're to die to ourself daily. Bring our lives into complete submission to Jesus Christ. Paul tells us in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And then he goes on, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. That's what the Holy Spirit is seeking to work into our lives to show us how to live our lives marked by not only self-control, but, but joy and stability and virtue and perseverance. And that's the next virtue we, see to, 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 we need to lavishly apply, the next supplement we need to implement. Verse four, uh, it says perseverance. Now, this word perseverance means patient endurance. You know, one of the things that you learn pretty quickly soon after coming to the Lord is there, there's no shortcuts to spiritual growth. In the same way, you don't get, you know, like these, these weightlifters strong physically by just deciding to work out for one day. All you'll get is sore for the next three days, for some of us a few weeks. But if you want to get stronger physically, you have to be disciplined to keep working out even when you're sore. 
In the same way, you don't get strong spiritually by one day deciding, well, I'm going to come to church. Spiritual growth doesn't happen overnight. You must put the work into it. No such thing as, as fast food Christianity. I think we can look at someone who we admire in the Lord and, and, and we can want to be like them. But we forget it takes time and work and discipline. Perhaps some of you have heard of Doyle Dykes. He's a, a, absolutely an incredible guitarist. I'd love to get him out here to the church. I'm going to try, but he's very, very talented. And, and I've watched him before, and he recalls a story when after, after you know, one of his times concerts he was at, a lady came up to him and said, man, I wish I could play like you. You're incredible. What's your secret? Tell me your secret. And, and he leans over and says, secret? And he motions her to come closer. Secret? Practice. <laughs> Practice some more. Practice. You know, no one just picks up a guitar for the first time and plays like Doyle Dykes. You know, I appreciate Pastor Bruce here at the church. You know, Bruce didn't decide to learn Greek and Hebrew, you know, last year so he can teach the class. You know, he's been learning the language since he was very, very young. Been through the Bible many, many times in Greek and Hebrew. Same way, you can't expect to have the same knowledge by attending just one Greek class. <laughs> Doesn't come that quickly. Now, I'm thankful for my computer. I can just right-click on a word and it gives me the Greek word right there. But, but the problem in our culture today is we want everything right now. We want, we want it right now. We don't want to wait. And if we don't get it right now, then we bail. Then we quit. And we do the same thing spiritually. Maybe make a commitment to the men's or women's study or to, to go. I'm, I'm going to start going to the GO team every first Friday of every month. I'm going to be there. I really got, man, I got to get back. In the, I'm going to be at Wednesday night Bible study every single week. And then you go, and then a couple Wednesdays, a couple months you miss, and, and, and then you're not going anymore. What's lacking is that supplement of perseverance. It's a Greek word, hupomoni. It's where we get our English word spumoni from. It means waiting for ice cream. No, it doesn't mean that. It means patient endurance. Patient endurance. In fact, James uses the same word, uh, not James, uh, the writer of Hebrews, uh, chapter 12, describing Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. It's that same word endured. It's, it's hupomoni. It describes not a passive, barely making it endurance, but a conquering, victorious endurance. That's what Jesus was doing at Calvary. Jesus conquered death. He conquered the grave, and he conquered sin. He patiently endured the cross. He persevered. Why? Because of the joy that was set before him. The joy set before him was you and I, a relationship with, with, with God our Father in heaven with him. That joy was seeing many people saved because of what he would accomplish through his death on the cross. That's why we need to close ourselves with patient endurance and perseverance because we know what's on the other side of this life. We can say, for the joy that is set before us, we should endure hardships that we face in this life. I think we need to keep that always in the forefront of our minds. Paul writes in Galatians 6, 9, let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Number five of our supplements, Peter says in verse six, add to perseverance godliness. Godliness. Godliness simply means God-likeness. In the original Greek, this word meant to worship well. It describes a person who worships well the Lord God. Someone who's, who's walking right in their relationship with God. Perhaps the word reverence comes closer to defining this term. It's that quality of inner character that causes a person to live above the petty things of this life, the passions and the pressures that control the lives of others. It's remembering what you do and why you're doing what you do. That it's all for, for the glory of God and how you live your life is now just to please Him. Not because I want to be a better person or better husband or better wife. That's all secondary. But first and foremost is my desire to please the Lord and glorify Him. In other words, everything I do is going to go through a filter that says to me, what, what does God think? Will this please God if I do this? Will this glorify Him if I act this way? If I say this thing or do this thing or go to this place? Does this draw me closer to the Lord or further away from the Lord? 
If I'm not drawing closer to the Lord, then, then why in the name of Christian liberty are we participating in those things? We need to stop. Again, like moral excellence, if I'm adding to my faith godliness, then I'm not going to hang out with people who are going to bring me down, pull me back into my old life. I'm not going to hang out with people who are always gossiping and complaining and putting others down because that will bring me down. If I'm adding to my faith godliness and I'm not going to go to, to certain movies or, 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 or you know, some bar or grill because they serve some new alcoholic beverage, it, it's just not going to be an option for me. It's not going to be my desire. Why? Because I want my life to be marked by that of godliness. Now, if you're seeking to live a godly life, then you're going to seek to do the will of God. And as you do, it's going to naturally lead to the next supplement, brotherly kindness, the sixth supplement in verse 7. It's a Greek word, Philadelphia, which certainly was a virtue that Peter must have learned the hard way. <clears throat> I mean... You think about these disciples <clears throat> of our Lord, and they often disagreed with each other. They often had little, little spats with each other. <clears throat> In fact, we read in Luke chapter 9, verse 46, that a dispute arose among them as to which one of them would be the greatest. I'm the greatest, or not, am so, or not, am so, I am. That's where Jesus comes in and says, uh, who's the greatest? And he picked up a little child and taught his disciples what it mean to be, meant to be great in the kingdom of God. But they were arguing and they were disputing among, uh, among each other. But the point that Peter is making is that if we love Jesus Christ, then we must have a love for the brethren, a love for our brothers, a love for our sisters in the Lord. We learn that in 1 Peter 1, verse 22, when we're told that we have sincere love of the brethren and to love one another fervently with a pure heart. Hebrews 13, 1 says, let brotherly love continue. It's, it's Brotherly kindness. Now you can say that you love your brother, you love your sister, but you, and you can still not be kind to that person. Or the person may not be kind to you. That's not brotherly kindness or sisterly kindness. You're missing the last half of that. You're missing the message. Paul puts it this way in Romans 12.10, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. Kindly affectionate. In fact, the Bible says in 1 John 5, 1 and 2 that when we love our brothers and sisters in Christ that way, it's evident that we're truly born again. You know, after pastoring for some now 23 years here, I've noticed that the most loving people are the ones that I see serving the most. Now, that's not saying that, that those who aren't involved aren't loving. It's just that from my, my perspective, when I see those servants here in the church, you know, serving the Lord, they, man, they just love the people. They, 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 they love the Lord. So much. Now, if I don't see that, you know, if you're not involved, it, it's hard for me to get to know you, but, but it's, my point is this. It's impossible to establish relationships in a church, to have that brotherly love for one another. If, if you get here right before service starts and you leave right as soon as the, the last song is actually still playing. If you can, you know, come more than just Sunday morning, hang out a little bit, get to know some of the people and get involved because we're a family. And as a family, we enjoy getting together. You know, my, my family, you know, we have five kids, and they're all married. And, and when we get together, we have a blast. It's usually every single weekend, and, 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 and it's nice when we, everybody goes home at the end of the weekend. But, but still, we have a good time, a blast. I love getting together. Same thing in the church. I, I so look forward to Coming here on Sunday morning, oh man, I get to see these people, I get to love these people, I get to serve these, oh Lord, I'm excited to see, see family. Kindly, uh, brotherly, sisterly, love one for another. That brings us to our final supplement we need to apply, and that's the greatest one of them all. Verse 7, and to brotherly kindness, love. Love. God's agape love. Agape love is a love we see with Jesus on the cross. It's a sacrificial love. I love that at the end of these seven things, Peter ends with number seven, love. You know, it's a, it's a biblical number of completeness. Without love, we're not complete. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, and now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Oh, how we need to have not only love for one another, but we should have love for all men. We should certainly have the love that Jesus had for the lost. Jesus loved the lost. 
He came to seek and to save those who were lost. And if we're one of His, if we've supplemented our lives with godliness and brotherly love, then we will look at the world in the same way that our Lord did. A harvest that's just ready to be gathered. Souls that are just on the verge of being saved, just ready and waiting for someone like you to come along and share with them the hope of the gospel. You're going to have his heart and his eyes and his focus towards the world. You'll have a love for God to please him and bring glory to his name. You'll have a love for your brother and sister in the Lord, and you will generally have love for the lost when you realize all that God has done for you and for me. As we supplement our lives with these seven things, virtue and knowledge and self-control and perseverance and godliness and, and brotherly kindness and love, the Lord is going to then enable us to grow, spiritual growth. See, each one of these supplements lead to the other. I don't want you to think, you can, well, I'll take that one, but I, I'm not sure if I like that one. I'll, I'll work on this one, but yeah, I'm just going to leave that one. No, you can't do that. They're all connected, They're like, like, like patio lights or Christmas lights. So if you have faith, that's going to produce a life of virtue. You'll have a moral, excellent life of virtue. That'll lead to knowing God better. You know God better, you'll become more self-controlled. After you're more self-controlled, you'll be able to persevere under the load better. And when you do that, you become godlier. And all that leads to a, a genuine care and kindness towards people and a sacrificial love. They're all connected. So now you've taken all these supplements that means now spiritual growth. Spiritual growth. Look at verse 8. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I like that. The more we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the more we stay committed to the study of His Word, and the more we stay committed to loving one another, loving the lost, the stronger we're going to become. And, and man, we need to be strong in the days in which we're living. But it's a payoff. You know, weightlifters know this. You know, they, they work and work and work, and pretty soon you're going, oh, I'm not the same guy I was six months ago. Uh, you're getting stronger. Same way spiritually, God will pour out into your life and my life opportunity after opportunity to be used by Him. Because you're, you're stronger now and you, you can stand strong. Listen to 2 Chronicles 16, 9. It tells us, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart are loyal to him. The eyes of the Lord are looking for those that are loyal to him, those whose, whose heart are, are loyal to his. And if you're loyal to the Lord, it's going to bring out practical results in your life. Using the resources that God has given to us, the precious promises, and for walking and put in, in the promises and putting to use the seven things the Lord lavishly supplies for us, then God, God's mathematics, he says your adding equals his abounding. Look at verse 8 again. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter uses the illustration of a fruit-bearing tree. You're like, you're like a fruit-bearing tree that has been planted in the most favorable conditions possible. He says, if these things are yours and abound, your tree's not going to be barren. There's going to be fruit. You know, you got great soil. You're fertilizing it. You're watering it. It's great land. Maybe it's right by the river there. And, and man, you're going to have fruit. Actually, the word barren there also means idle. You will, you will be neither idle or unfruitful. See, a person who loves the Lord in this way isn't going to just going to be sitting back on, oh, it's great, I'm saved. No, they're, they're going to want to be used by God. They're going to be busy serving Christ. And, and, and in that busyness, it's going to produce fruit. Now in verse 9, Peter goes on to tell us that those who are not living their lives to the fullest, you might say those who are not working out, well, they're out of shape. In fact, they run out of breath just getting out of bed. Well, that's what Peter says, spiritually speaking. If we don't apply these supplements that God has so lavishly supplied for us, look at verse 9. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Short-sighted means they can't see the danger far ahead. Even to blindness means they're living in darkness rather than light. You know, nutritionists tell us that, that certain foods can affect your vision. You know, if you eat, eat too much sugar, 
You know, you can get diabetes, and we know diabetes affects your, your, your vision. And, and, and the same thing is true in the spiritual realm. If we're only taking in the, the junk food of this world, it's going to cause more and more blindness. Even though our eyes have been opened at one time, man, you can, you can start you know, getting darker and darker. I mean, picture somebody walking down the road and then they're squinting. That's the picture that Peter is painting here, somebody trying to make progress while they're squinting. Eventually you're going to stumble. You're going to fall. You're going to fall because you're only concerned with temporal things. But someone who's, who's, who's ever-growing, ever-expanding, adding and never content with, with stopping, they can see where they've come from and they see where, where they're going. I like what Warren Wiersbe says. If we forget what God has done for us, we will not be excited to share Christ with others. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, we've been purged and forgiven. God has opened our eyes. Let's not forget what he has done. Rather, let's cultivate gratitude in our hearts and sharpen our spiritual vision. Life is too brief and the needs of the world too great for God's people to be walking around with their eyes closed. That's a good point. Finally, Peter says this in verse 10 and 11. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What is the reward for training hard, for applying these supplements to our faith, for living for Christ to the fullest? It's an abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't want to get to heaven and God go, Whew, you made it. Or me go, Whew, I made it. What is interesting is that the Greeks use this term, an abundant entrance, to describe an Olympic, an Olympic athlete who won the Olympics and, and came back home and he would be greeted with an, an abundant, abundant entrance, they called it. The whole town would show up. There'd be songs that were sung and cheers that went up and they would receive this, this abundant welcome. When I think of an abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I can't help but think of, of Billy Graham when he finally entered to heaven or Pastor Chuck Smith. Man, I think that abundant entrance that, that, that must have been. But more than that, I think of men and women who we've never heard of that lived their lives for Christ, completely serving the Lord, maybe praying fervently for the crusades over the years. They have that abundant entrance into heaven. See, see, it's not about how much you've done or how popular you became. It's about how faithful you were and doing those things that God has called you to do. I think of our dear brother, George Barankovich, who just went home to be with the Lord. I know he received an abundant entrance into heaven after, after spending time at his funeral there. His favorite verse was this, 2 Corinthians 4.17, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And he experienced that. See, all truly born-again Christians are going to end up in heaven. And our capacity to enjoy heaven, I think, is going to be based on our faithfulness to what God has called us to do while we're here on this earth. I heard this great illustration about this. When we get to heaven, our lives are going to be like containers. We'll all be filled to overflowing, but some will be the size of Dixie cups, some will be the size of 32-ounce super-sized cups, while others will be the size of a 55-gallon drum. Same way, we're, we're all going to receive crowns for what we've done here on this earth in serving the Lord. There's going to be some crowns with no jewels on them, while others have some barely seen, while others will be covered in jewels, and I want mine covered in jewels. Why? Because I want them better than you? Yes. No, that's not why. No, because I want to be able to take that crown and put it at Jesus' feet and say, this is none of me, this is all of you. I want an abundant entrance into heaven. Do you want that as well? then take the resources that God has lavishly supplied for us and use them. Put our faith into action, a faith that leads to growth and growth that leads to practical results in the life and service of God's people. I want to close with this. I read about a man who decided to go across the Atlantic Ocean. A lot of people have done that, no big deal. But what made this so remarkable is that this man wanted to do it in the smallest boat ever to attempt to cross the Atlantic Ocean only 13 feet long. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's the size of a surfboard. He called it Tinkerbell. He named it, his name was Robert Manry, and it took him 78 days. 
said that his rudder broke uh, uh, several times. He was washed overboard several times. And sometimes in the shipping lanes, it was so bad that he, he couldn't sleep. He said, I had to stay awake for several days because it was too dangerous. And he would take a rope and he would bind himself to the boat so he can stay on it. 78 days later, he could see the shores of England. The only thing that went through his mind is, I need a hotel room, I need a shower, and I need to sleep for a week or so. He was just so discouraged and so exhausted. But as he's nearing the shore, he noticed that there were 300 other boats sitting there waiting to welcome him to the shore. And when he got to the shore, there were 40,000 people in the crowd cheering him on for making the journey successful. At that moment, he didn't think about how tired he was. He didn't think about how discouraged he was. He didn't think about a shower. It felt so good. Listen, when you stand in heaven, that crown goes on your head. You'll never regret the hours you spent in Bible study. You'll never regret the hours you spent in prayer or sharing your faith or helping another person grow in their walk with the Lord or just in helping to encourage you, to help the, to build them up to encourage you. You're not going to regret that. Again, 2 Corinthians 4.17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceedingly and eternal weight of glory. Finally, as we close, if we've been talking about all the things that God has given to us in this Christian life, in this world. But let me say this. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you're empty. You got nothing. You need to take that first step. You need to recognize that you're a sinner and you need to get saved. You need to turn from your sin, ask God to forgive you of it, and accept the sacrifice that Jesus made upon that cross. And come to him and tell him, God, I'm sorry for my sin. I turn from it today and I want to commit my life to you right now, right this morning. And God will give you, uh, he'll save you, he'll give you that faith, he'll give you everything you need for life and godliness, and then you can start adding the supplements and be blessed in this life. So if you've not given your life to the Lord, please, as soon as service is over, please come up and talk to me. I'd love to pray with you, give you a Bible, let you know what it means to follow Christ. If you're watching online, please drop us a line. Let us know you, you, you did that, you gave your life to the Lord so we can get a Bible to you and help you walk in, in, in your walk with the Lord. So with that, let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time this morning, Lord. Thank you just for pointing out to these things, Lord, that you've lavishly applied for us, Lord. They're all sitting there uh, on a shelf, and you just want us to come and take them. Lord, you want us to, to have that virtue and the knowledge and the self-control and the perseverance and the godliness and the brotherly kindness and most of all love. Lord, if, and if we're lacking in those things, even now, show us, Lord, those areas, those things that we need to hear, that we need to apply, that we need to put in our lives. Lord, we need all of them. But Lord, maybe there's, there's some we need more than others at this point. Lord, help us to pray, to seek your face, to apply these truths to our lives, that it would change us, make us stronger in the days in which we're living. And finally, Lord, I do pray if there's anyone here or anyone watching that doesn't have that relationship with you, touch their heart, open their eyes, help them to see their need to come to you today. Thank you for this time this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I saw Stan and do one last song together. We are the ones that you have called Out of the world to be set apart for you We want to be whole It's dark to have a fire burning in our hearts for you. We want to be holy. For we are not our own. We've been born with the blood of Jesus. We are not at home in this world. Right.
face with the life you gave for us. We want to be holy. Breathe in your life now inside of man to mold the hearts with your nail pierced hands for us. We want to That's our prayer. That's our heart. That's our desire. God bless you guys. Have a great week. If you need any prayer whatsoever, please come up so we can pray for you. We'll see you back again on Wednesday or ladies Thursday, whenever, Sunday. God bless. <laughs>